So, uh, from Vilnius, uh, we will be going straight to Reykjavik. And uh, we will, uh, as mentioned, we are having right now um, our last presentation. We've been saving it for you. So, uh, keep your ears open. And uh, we will discuss the future of AI's impact on society. We've just recently talked about it with Claudio, but now it's time to go deeper. And for this, I would like to invite Dr. Kristin Torrison, uh, who is a full research professor of computer science at Reykjavik University and founding director of the Icelandic Institute for Intelligent Machines. During his three decade long career in artificial intelligence, uh, he worked in R&D, he worked uh, at British Telecom, MIT and Lego, founded several startups, lectured on AI at Columbia University, uh, at KTH and Reykjavik University and consulted on robotics for NASA and Honda, uh, among others. Over the past decade, Dr. Torison and his team have developed a new kind of AI that can learn complex tasks from experience via recursive self-programming. Dr. Torison has been an advisor on AI uh, to the Prime Minister of Iceland and the Swedish government. He is a two-time recipient of the Kurzweil Award for his work on general machine intelligence. So sounds like a wonderful wrap-up of the whole conference and our main stage. So I would like to welcome Dr. Christian. Hi, Ian. Thank you, Sharon. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. So as mentioned, hey, your, Thank your, you. your presentation will be um, like a nice wrap-up. Uh, we discussed about many things today, uh, about the societal impacts, about what AI is going to do for us as a society, how our governments uh, are going to adapt, how our Generation Z is going to um, come and uh, overcome us. Uh, and it's super exciting to see what will be your presentation. Yeah, um, so I get the easiest job uh, of all, which is to predict the future. Well, uh, <laughs> where is your magic fortune teller ball? As you know, <laughs> uh, that's the trillion euro question. The future of AI's impact on society. But um, I have a lot to tell you, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I'm going to present to you uh, three claims. Um, the first one is that the rate of progress in automation using AI will depend primarily on basic research in AI. And I'll go through what that means. Um, that the rate of progress in basic uh, research on AI will depend on progress on three or four, depending on how you count, different uh, attributes of intelligence. And these are, and, and please don't be scared by the words. You can go back and look at these later and look them up. And also wait for the general AI community to, to start talking more about them. Um, the first one I want to mention is general cumulative learning. This is also called self-supervised learning. Um, another one which is not talked about so much is ampliative reasoning over, over that, that knowledge that's been learned. So uh, we're not just talking about reasoning because reasoning has been around forever in AI. It's been uh, talked about since the very beginning. Uh, we are talking about reasoning over the knowledge that's acquired cumulatively. A um, uh, third one is creative autonomous attention control. And uh, the fourth one is uh, transversal temple in causal knowledge representation, i.e. knowledge about time and causes. Very simple. Um, and um, my third claim it, it has to do with the bigger picture, and that, that's the bigger one. And, and I, I'm going to give you, a, hold up a, a little bit of a mirror here to, um, to talk about how AI might uh, play out over the next decades. And my claim is basically that AI will have at least as much of an impact as uh, the impact of the Industrial Revolution on society. Now, how long that will take uh, that is, of course, uh, the as I said, the trillion euro question. But um, so uh, let's move on. Our goal today, therefore, is to answer this question 
uh, over the next, say, 50 years, because most people are not willing to think any further, uh, how will AI impact society? Now, the thing is, the, the reason this is a difficult question to answer is that complex things like uh, technology and society and so on, that there are, they have a lot of dependencies. And depending on the particulars of how these play out over time, historically, um, will have a huge impact on exactly what will happen when. So uh, just to, to mention a few of these factors that matter here, world politics, funding, skills education, research breakthroughs, industry needs, etc. Now I have uh, at least uh, 30 years of, of experience in AI, but that is not nearly enough for me to grasp all of that breadth uh, of importance. So specifics are really difficult to predict. And therefore, I propose to you instead that we will find a, a different way uh, than particulars to answer the question of the impact of AI. And it includes decomposing three phenomena, AI, research and development, and society. And I will break these down uh, to one level of detail to provide you with a framework that hopefully helps you answer this question in a little bit better way. Uh, so instead of giving you only answers, I will give you a tool and just partial answers. And I hope you will uh, walk away uh, satisfied with that because in fact, I believe you will be more satisfied than if I were to just throw out some uh, predictions. Now, why a framework? Um, I already sort of touched on this. Um, well, if you look into, you know, years into the future or, uh, or, or even decades, um, you'll realize that there's so many factors that will interact along the way that things could end up very differently from what you thought. Um, they might not end up categorically different, but they might end up in particulars very different. Um, so uh, there are basically too many factors for us to, tell, to, to give you or to, to have a, a particular timeline to predict. And so a framework is actually more valuable for this purpose. Um, now, how is this framework going to work that I'm uh, trying to, uh, to sell to you? All right. Um, well, it depends uh, essentially on, on, on two, two things, two tasks. One is let's dissect these three phenomena into some constituent parts where we can talk about and analyze their dependencies and relationships. All right. It's not that complicated. And so it's a framework that is essentially a de dependencies-based prediction toolkit, all right? Um, and this, this will help us uh, to identify AI trends to separate what may be near-term from what is probably far-term, uh, to understand modern AI limitations and how to get out of them possibly, call out some of the bullshit that's uh, been... Uh, spilled in, in uh, the lesser knowledgeable, uh, uh, let's say, news outlets. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of companies selling a lot of things and they call it AI. Um, so this toolkit or this framework will, will give you a toolkit for thinking about those claims as well. Okay. And uh, even more importantly, possibly, is to assess needs and opportunities for automation. All right. So on, <clears throat> onward and upwards, uh, a framework for thinking about the future of AI. We, as I said, uh, we base this on a, a dissection of these three things, R&D, intelligence and AI and society. And we start with R&D. Now, uh, a lot of what I'm gonna tell you, you probably know already. But I need to, to provide that to, uh, to give the context for, for, um, for my approach here. So um, it's very important to realize that R&D is not just R&D. It is actually um, uh, a timeline. And on one end of the timeline, you have basic research. This is the, this is the technology that's furthest away from being applicable. 
And on the other end, you have applied research, which is um, research that's very close or even almost ready to be used for practical purposes. And these two ends of the, of the R&D spectrum have very different driving mechanisms. Um, in, but in research, rate of progress essentially means the speed of creating new knowledge. And um, the creation of fundamentally new knowledge, i.e. not incremental small changes and improvement, but improvements, but rather uh, large and impactful new ideas, is the realm of basic research. Um, and in, in, the, in this case, uh, what we're talking about is, uh, is the research on intelligence and how to put that into a machine. So, um, so basic research in AI is the task of automating thought processes. And applied research in AI is essentially applying the fruits of that labor to practical tasks. If we paint a picture of this um, with the left-hand side, uh, well, you, we could think of that, we, uh, let's say that we are positioned here uh, on the left. Uh, we come up with a bright idea. Well, we have to implement it in some way, in some technological framework, and we have to maybe make some prototypes. And, and by the way, you know, time is ticking. This all takes time. It takes skills uh, and funding. And so at some point we may end up with a refined prototype or demonstration, um, which allows us to put things into production. Um, so from the viewpoint of, of industry, it, um, if, if we are uh, essentially waiting for some new idea to come along, um, we may not be willing to bet on something that is four to six years away from uh, implementation. Um, so this, this uh, uh, conveyor belt of ideas, moving ideas from, from blue sky to practice, um, involves a lot, of, a lot of things, including ch skill transfer and training, retooling, changing your toolkit, improving your toolkit, and um, bringing blue sky ideas to, to reality. Um, so fundamental knowledge about how to automate intelligence is essentially a prerequisite for applying automated intelligence in government, business, health industry, and so on. And basic research is primarily uh, performed in academia. And so this is why um, progress on the application of AI depends on progress of basic research. And of course, the, the speed of basic research depends then on human ingenuity, funding, and other enabling factors. All right, so that's the dissection that you need to have in mind of the R&D landscape here. Now let's, uh, let's dissect AI. Okay, we'll start with the question. Is the task of AI that, that AI set out to, to, do, to do create maybe, let's say, a human level intelligence in a machine. Is it done? Is it finished? Is it accomplished? No. Everyone knows that. Um, there, are, there are a lot of cognitive processes that we recognize in humans and even in animals, other animals than humans, uh, that have not yet been figured out how to put in a machine. Um, and, uh, but, but here's something that, that fewer people have thought about. Um, the, there's a current heavy limitation to a modern AI technologies. Um, that is that there is no learning in these machines after it leaves the lab. That's how I came up with this horrible acronym here. Uh, bear with me. AILL, after it leaves the lab. In other words, modern AI does not do cumulative learning. It is not capable of learning and adapting on the fly in open environments. So essentially, it is, it is autonomy free in a sense. Um, it cannot guide its own learning and it cannot learn in a goal directed way. There's only a single simple goal and uh, that's all it can keep track of. Of course, as you know, humans can keep track of multiple goals and balance goals and talk about goals and evaluate goals and so on. 
uh, some are, of our goals may be very explicit, like I am on my way to, to work. Other goals may be uh, much less obvious, like the pursuit of happiness. But in any case, um, uh, these are missing, and, and so is uh, something that we call reasoning. So modern AI systems cannot learn about the limits of their own uh, knowledge, and that means that there aren't really any trustworthy AI systems. Okay, that in itself, of course, requires a whole other lecture, and so we have to move on. Sorry about that. Um, I would love to come back and talk more about that, but um, time is ticking. Now, um, here are the the four uh, processes that I mentioned in the, in the beginning that have yet to be automated. What are cognitive processes? Well, these are thought processes. These are things that that the human mind is capable of. Okay. So um, I mentioned general cumulative learning. This is essentially learning on the fly as you go. Ampliative reasoning, that means a collection of different reasoning mechanisms, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you what they are in a minute. Um, and and note a minute, this, has, this reasoning has to apply, has to be applicable to knowledge that's acquired autonomously, that the system learned on its own, without going back to the lab, so after it leaves the lab. Um, creative attention control, uh, this is essentially the question of, do you know what to pay attention to? It doesn't matter if you're crossing the street, stacking some shelves, learning uh, uh, to play squash, whatever it is that you're doing. You have to know where to put your attention. Uh, but this is only relevant if you can keep track of more than one goal, frankly. So um, you can see how these are somewhat codependent. And uh, transversal knowledge representation, that means um, knowledge, uh, knowledge that applies to anything and everything. Essentially, you need to be able to bring knowledge about causal relations and about the passage of time to anything that you learn and anything that you know. If you can't, uh, well, you couldn't give a talk like this and finish on time. Let's see if I can meet that requirement. Okay, so uh, we continue. Now, let's go into one of, in each of these. Um, I, I, I warned you, I have to go fast here, um, and, and this is maybe quite a bit to take in, um, but um, I, um, I will not go any deeper than, than this level, so uh, bear with me. When people learn, they do so incrementally, they learn cumulatively, because information about the world doesn't present itself all at once. It's impossible to make that happen. You couldn't possibly make something that is relevant for tomorrow happen now, because it's going to happen tomorrow. So um, that's why we need cumulative learning, and we need machines that can do this. It will. It, this holds for all practical AI. And and, and by the way, um, when we when we say theoretical AI, uh, we're we're not taking. We're not. We don't want to to say. AI that couldn't ever happen. Um, for that, we should we should really call it hypothetical AI. And and frankly, there is no such thing as hypothetical AI because only practical AI is worth talking about. It, only if you can implement it is it really intelligence. Um, so machines can't do this yet. What will it take? Well, it we have to make machines that can learn most things generally speaking. That that has a that they have a general way of learning that, that uh, they're not so extremely limited to a particular domains. Um, we, we need to solve how knowledge is created incrementally, autonomously. And we need a lot more research, basic research. So this is not yet going to happen, no matter what you may read in, your, in articles. Um, reasoning. What is reasoning? Well, we all have a, more or less a, a, an intuitive idea of what reasoning is. Um, it is basically this. It's on-demand application of logic to knowledge about everyday situations or knowledge about stuff that you know about, right? Um, what, do we, what do we mean by ampliative reasoning? Well, there are essentially at least four types of reasoning. 
um, deduction, which is the most obvious one, um, where, uh, you know, this is a ball, and if you kick a ball, it will, it will roll. And now I'm kicking this ball, so it will roll. Abduction uh, is, is what Sherlock Holmes does so really well. Uh, given a situation, he figures out how it came to be. Uh, we use this all, all day long, every day. Induction, generalization, this, of course, is most obviously happening in the early days of, uh, in our youth, where we, have to, to not, where we have to generalize to not have to learn all things, uh, all particulars about every situation. And analogy, you know, that's, the, that's obvious. So uh, because the world presents infinite variety, you couldn't possibly pre-compute all of this. There will never, never exist the kind of computer that can do that, not even in theory. Um, and also, we cannot possibly know if we know all the rules about the world, as uh, physicists are so painfully reminded of every day who are working in quantum theory. So um, that means you don't know the axioms, and that means the reasoning must be of the non-axiomatic kind. All right. Creative attention control, what does that mean? Well, as I mentioned, you know, you need to know where to focus your attention um, for anything you want to achieve, for anything you want to do. So um, uh, to be situated in a task and be halfway through, you have to know what comes next and uh, where, to, uh, where to look, where to, where to th what to think about and what to listen to. Um, and most complex tasks, of course, have multiple goals. Attention is, is really just resource control. You know, your eyes have a limited intake of information, your ears as well. You need to know where to point them and what to think about. And this, this control must be context sensitive because you can't possibly know that beforehand because the world is, is, is forever changing. Why do I say creative attention control? Well, because the world is full of surprises. So you couldn't be too literal. You have to be creative. All right, uh, last one. Um, trans, no, second to last one. In any case, um, transversal knowledge means uh, knowledge that you can apply to anything at any time, more or less. Um, so uh, time and cause must be represented uh, in this way, uh, transversal. Um, because anything, anything and everything happens in time. There's nothing in, the, in your experience, in, in my experience, in our experience, in our common world, that doesn't happen in time. It's all time dependent. So how, how is it that uh, AI has been able to ignore time for so long? Well, it's, it's convenient. It's convenient to ignore time. And so uh, and the same thing can be said about causal relations. Um, to get anything done, you have to know what leads to what. Uh, and uh, this is uh, essential to get anything done, right? So, and this, this knowledge about time and cause and effect, side effect as well, must be of the kind where you can then apply the ampliative non-axiomatic uh, reasoning, right? Enough of word salad. Now, when will these be solved? I, I, I imagine some of you may be thinking. Well, we don't know. You know, that's, and that's not really um, the answer you wanted, but uh, that's unfortunately the answer you'll get. Um, and as I said, it does depend on basic research, primarily. Of course, there are dependencies here, you know, including how much do companies fund basic research? How much are they willing to look ahead? And sometimes um, that makes all the difference. Um, so, um, another related question, when will the singularity happen? I'm not going to tell you what the singularity is. If you don't know, look it up. Uh, nobody knows that either. And uh, even if some articles might make you think uh, otherwise. It really depends. Uh, oh, and I'll make, take this opportunity to mention that you don't want necessarily those four uh, 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 cognitive processes that I mentioned before um, 
solved separately. They kind of need to work together. And, you know, ultimately the big effect will be when they all are in the same cognitive system working together. Um, so, <clears throat> another question we could ask is, what if we could now let's say let's wait fast forward to the date when these have all been implemented in a machine um what will the automation of these enable or even the automation of one of these in in isolation well uh, there's in fact it will have a big effect because it will allow you to automate a lot more than you can currently with ai okay and now we come to the last dissection this is the dissection of society. Now I want you to think, to, to think back. The automation of muscle power is the driver of the industrial revolution. And I say the industrial revolution, but of course there are you know, many, uh, rev many revolutions under the, the big rev industrial revolution that we talked about that started maybe um, 200 years ago. Well, what, what, uh, what does this involve? It, it is the automation of muscle power. So, um, and, and they run on various uh, fuels, uh, but mostly gasoline and electricity so far. Um, now, this has been happening over the past 200 years. That's a pretty long time. But now motors are everywhere. We couldn't really go through our day without um, touching or using a motor somewhere. If you if you work in a high-rise, you use motors to get from one floor to the other, and so on. It is an enormous, an enormous source of change. And, and now if we think back to actual muscle power, that is, you know, the power that, that uh, allows me to, to flap my mouth uh, at you right now. Well, um, what is it limited to in, so, in modern society? You could, you could list, it's a short list, actually. Manipulation of tools, communication, art and music, yeah, and the gym, you know? Yeah, you, you really use your muscles in the gym. So that's a very short list. Um, and interestingly enough, if you look at this, um, if we dissect this a bit further, um, here's, a, here's a dimension from expert to kind of the average Joe and Jane. Um, the um, manipulation of tools, communication, etc. Right? Uh, if you're an expert, it, it's it involves things like microscope, cr cranes, boats, and stuff. You're 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 just pushing buttons, right? You're pushing buttons. You're looking at some screens, etc. Um, if you're an amateur, you you're using power tools. You you have specialized gadgets and so on. Uh, some very common things that people do all over the planet is, is drive cars and use computers, scissors, etc. And um, almost everyone, or practically everyone, uh, is able to talk and gesture and things like that. So, you know, if we think about this in terms of intelligence, um, if you go from universal, the universal uh, skills here, to the expert, um, what you see is an increase in training. Um, if you if you look at it the other way, if you go from expert to universal, you actually see an increase in common sense, which is very interesting. So this is a trend uh, from um, and and it, it basically makes it obvious that the role uh, of of muscle power in in this is minuscule compared to the uh, role of brain power, and, and in fact. The society runs on brain power, and that's essentially what this shows. So uh, it just so happens that AI is the automation of brain power. Um, whatever humans currently do in society, and that requires thought, training, skill, and or judgment, may be automated when our AIs can handle it. Now, when will that time come? Well, again, that's the trillion euro question. One thing we can uh, uh, do to, to try to uh, understand a little bit better where we're at is answering, uh, is looking, is analyzing where AI is right now. So if we compare it to the most important phenomenon on the planet, the source of the idea of AI is, of course, natural intelligence. 
And um, here are scattered around some concepts that have a, a lot to do with um, intelligence in nature. Understanding evolution, control, biology, cognitive development, consciousness, pattern matching. Yeah, these are just some of the very high level features of the phenomenon. And um, looking into the next five or ten years, which of these has AI gotten a handle on? Well, actually none, <clears throat> except pattern matching. All right? So, the AI revolution, or as I like to call it, the fourth industrial revolution, because it's, it's really the main driver, has just begun. Under the current market mechanisms, whatever is profitable to automate with AI will be automated with AI, unless governments, special interest groups, and society at large ensures that we don't succumb to its negative side effects. Okay, So we don't want to jeopardize democracy, the law, nation states, our monetary system, peace, etc., uh, our way of life. Um, so we have to be on the lookout. And this framework that I just presented to you might help you with that. So um, it is clear that the impact of AI will be far wide and deep. Societal transformation due to AI is going to be enormous. But how far will the transformation go? Well, it depends on the time scale we're looking. But I, do, I believe that we have good reason to think that it's not going to take 200 years. It might not even be 100 years. It might be only 50 years. And uh, will it be good uh, or evil? As for us to decide in future generations. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Kristen, for sharing your presentation. And uh, that was a really nice wrap up and uh, a look through the keyhole to our future. So as you mentioned, we already let our muscles power go and uh, machines and AI to replace it. But do you think the time is coming when uh, we actually let our brain power to go on a break and uh, allow some AI solutions to take a, a seat at the table and to take some important decisions uh, instead of us? No, I don't think so. Uh, that may not be the answer uh, this crowd wanted, but um, I think it is more appropriate to consider modern AI as a tool uh, than a person. It's certainly much, much closer to it. And uh, I think, in fact, uh, these kinds of thoughts, thought experiments to, to think like, what would it mean if we allow uh, an AI to take a seat at the board of a publicly traded company, for instance. Um, or even if we make it the chairman of the board, could we do that? Could we make a machine to take that role? Uh, I, I think these kinds of uh, thought experiments are interesting and useful, but um, I certainly hope that anyone doing that thought experiment comes to the conclusion that that is premature. As you mentioned, 50 years could be a time to experiment with, uh, with such things. Uh, or at least we will see what happens then. And uh, to summarize, it would be really nice to hear from you as a trendsetter. What would be the three main things we should look uh, in AI uh, during the 2022? Ah, so um, having both... Uh, one foot in academia and the other in industry, um, I can. Um, I suppose I'm in a, in an ideal position to uh, to answer you on that question. Now, this will will of course depend uh, very much on which country you're in, and um, even though many of the European countries uh, are uh, really up and running with AI, they are at very different places. And uh, those that have the best infrastructure for supporting innovation, uh, especially uh, startups and so on, are the best positioned to really make use of the latest and greatest in, uh, in AI technologies. Um, the, the transfer, if 
if a if a country has built up the infrastructure to uh, avoid delays in transferring good ideas and uh, uh, demonstrations from academia into industry at the highest speed possible, they will, of course, take the lead. Now, this, this may take five or ten years to actually be demonstrated because that's the time frame it takes for a startup to really blossom. But the countries that can do this uh, the best, and also we could say, you know, Europe as a whole compared to uh, the U.S., or, or even North America, uh, because Canada is, is really also uh, really good at AI and, and doing a lot. Um, you, can, you can look at that at different scales. Um, those, those companies that have the infrastructure to, to, let's say, remove hurdles on the path from idea to practice, those are the countries that will make the biggest impact, the biggest profit, and go at the highest speed. Um, of course, the, you, you cannot ignore academia in this, but uh, I, would, I would also mention that basic research does not only happen in academia. And so the flexibility of the infrastructure for allowing universities uh, to accept funding from, govern, from, uh, from companies and, uh, and governments as well, without um, detriment detrimental effects on the quality of the education per se, because of course that's the main role of universities. That will also help tremendously in um, ensuring that there are no major hurdles on the path from good idea to good product. Amazing. What a great wrap-up of, uh, of the main stage of our AI for government and society track. Thank you very much uh, for spending this uh, wonderful time with us. Thank you, Duke.